Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our event. My name is Atan Aslan, and I welcome you all to today's online event, Startup Disrupt from Corp Startup from Startup versus Corporate, where we will discuss about how corporate life is different from startup life and what are the challenges to both of these sectors. Startup Disrupt is a platform that educates, inspires, and connects entrepreneurs, startups, mentors, technology innovators, as well as investors and corporations, not only in Czech Republic, but also within startup communities around the world, like in Hungary. And now we are on our way to becoming a global startup hub, working to make uh, Czech Republic a global hub for innovation. To begin with, just in a nutshell, what today's streaming program looks like, we'll start with a panel discussion hosted by, the, by Zolt Bravari Nagy, head of partnership at Meout Group, and then we will jump in on pitch night wh uh, where EPO Society will present their project to us in three minutes, and our panelists will give feedback about their startups and also their uh, presentation. And now I'm, I'm going to pass the word to Zolt. And don't forget, you can send questions to Slido. And in the end, uh, our moderator Zolt will take those questions and discuss them with our panelists in turn. So uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy today's stream. And Zolt, the scene is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Atan. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to today's event called Startups versus Corporates, an event brought to you by Startup Disrupt. Um, I believe this is a very debated topic with a lot of pros and cons. Uh, my name is Jolt. I am a member of Miaus Group and the head of partnership at the Eurasian Startup Awards. And we have three uh, very experienced gentlemen uh, today. The first one is Zoltan Vardi. Uh, he's a former senior manager at multinational media companies and now developing and running his very own training program called The Launch Code. We have here Chaba Zaido. Um, he's a founder of Shoprenter one of the most well-known e-commerce engine in Hungary. He's the founder of Optimonk, a company focusing on customer acquisition. And uh, he's also the CEO and founder of Inonik, a Debrecen-based startup studio. And the third person we have here, András Vindai, uh, he's having a demonstrated history in, in the consulting industry. He was a former consultant, then a senior consultant, and now a manager at uh, Deloitte, Hungary. So I believe that's quite a lot of experience brought to this virtual table. Um, gentlemen, thank you all for coming in the first place. And uh, nice now I would, I would like to ask each of you to say a few things about yourself and uh, how did you start your journey in the corporate or the start of life, if you could give us a, a picture of that. Zoltan, let's start with you. Okay, sure. So, uh, so my name is Zoltan Vardy and I'm basically a business growth mentor, uh, a trainer and a speaker. I work with entrepreneurs to help them find their focus and to accelerate their business growth. Um, I tend to work with two types of startups, ones that are uh, sort of operating and functioning well, but have hit a snag, some sort of obstacle, and they're trying to find their product market fit, uh, or companies that have found their product market fit, but are ambitious and want to expand uh, uh, into a bigger uh, realm, either going internationally or um, or trying to build a larger or more functioning organization. Um, I work based on a system I developed, a business development framework called the Launch Code, um, which is basically a, um, a methodology that combines sort of corporate style planning with entrepreneurial execution and puts this into a, a 10 step guide to, to kind of developing and, and, and creating a, a successful and, and functioning business. Um, it's actually built on my professional background. So I have a 30 year global career um, 20 years of that spent in senior media executive positions at companies like NBC Universal, at Prozib and Sarainz in Hungary here. I was formerly the CEO of TV2. Um, but then I've also had 10 years of experience as an entrepreneur, an angel investor, um, and an advisor uh, at various stages of my career. So I'm actually uh, uh, somewhat unique in that I've stepped into the corporate world, stepped out of it, then stepped back into it, and so on a couple of times. So I've got, I think, a good sense of of the differences between these two environments. Thank you, um, Andras, if you could. Yes, yes. Thank you for thank you for having me. So my name is Andras Vinay. I'm a manager in the management consulting practice of Deloitte Hungary. Uh, I've been with the firm for five and a half years now. 
Uh, my focus within consulting and, and uh, management consulting is project management services and uh, post-merger integration designs, which means that I was mostly work on, on, on corporate transactions uh, after the deal has been finalized and work on how the future operating model uh, will, will work in the future organization and how to manage the process of, of, of such a merger. And I also wanted to say two things about uh, Deloitte as well, which were which was important for me to, to join and, and, and about management consulting. So first of all, the reason uh, I, I, I chose Deloitte was from a per employee point of view that is a relatively open occupation. So you can get to different industries uh, as an entry-level uh, consultant and get to know different projects from IT implementation, strategy, transactional project, or, or even cost-cutting ones. And from another perspective is the, is the career path, is that, uh, is that uh, there is a sort of a, a set, set of, of, of positions and the set of uh, soft skills and hard skills you need to, to, to get in order to get to an, a level. And it, it is quite obvious. So these were two uh, driving uh, forces for me to, to join such a company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Chaba? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chaba Laidu. I am founder of uh, Indonik. Uh, as as uh, you've heard, uh, we are Debrecen based and it's a startup studio. Uh, we are building multiple startups simultaneously. There's actually seven, seven and a half uh, brands already. Uh, within the Indonesia group. Uh, the bigger ones are Shoprenter, Optimum, Conversific, Codersrank. Um, and uh, well, there's, we are already more than 100 people working all together in this group. And our annual record of revenue is about uh, 6 million US dollars. Um, uh, personally, myself, I've never worked at any other company except this one. <laughs> uh, I started my career in, in 2006. Um, so I have no personal experience of what is corporate uh, life uh, you know, looks like, but uh, we've hired quite a lot of people coming from corporates. And uh, well, I definitely have a lot of experience how uh, people coming from the small and medium businesses and how people coming from large corporations, even from Microsoft or other large enterprises uh, behave and what their expectations are and uh, well where do they usually turn uh, where do they have uh, disappointments or where do they usually excel so uh, i hope i can add to this conversation i believe yes yes uh, all of you have quite a good experience uh, i have a very general question to start it off uh, with um, like can you talk about how the life is in startup as corporates, and I have this question to Zoltan as, as a starter because he's been working with big corporations before, and now you're more into this entrepreneur startup world. Like, what are the main differences that you see between them? The key elements, mm -hmm. key points. Well, I'd say that the, the defining principle in uh, in corporate world versus startup world is their approach to two things, which is planning and execution. That's what different differentiates the two. Um, corporations are very focused on on planning and trying to predict the future as much as possible in all possible scenarios. And when it comes to execution, they tend to be, um, well, let's just say diplomatically a bit slow in terms of bringing the ideas to life. Um, I think with startups, it's quite the opposite. Their planning is not very important and not very focused part of the work, but execution is very much at the center of everything they do. And so it's actually the clash of these mindsets, which creates, I think, the distinction between these two different worlds and what I've discovered and, and what frankly forms the basis of the launch code and the whole the whole concept that I've created is how do you combine the best of these two worlds? Um, because corporations are very planning focused, um, the environment you're up operating is very structured. Uh, it's somewhat predictable. Um, it's very detail focused. Um, it's all about trying to find that niche within that organization where you can add value. Um, and I think there's benefits to it because you learn a lot of professional skills. You learn about collaboration. You work about you learn about teamwork, uh, respect for authority. So these are all the good things. Uh, on the startup side, 
um, it's very much about trying to, to, to manage constant um, uncertainty, uh, in some cases managing chaos, uh, and, and trying to find that path and that focus that ultimately will lead to success. And, and I think the positive sides of the, the startup environment is that you actually have an opportunity to fail, which is, I think, a good thing. And you get the chance to actually experience um, uh, disappointment, which actually builds your persistence. And I think the people who are very good in that environment are, are generally very persistent um, and, and self-motivated. Yeah, I can, I can absolutely agree, uh, especially about the chaos. Uh, but uh, what's most surprising for people coming from uh, big enterprises is that how uh, chaotic it is uh, with us. We have very few rules and basically uh, no written processes, uh, mostly because uh, whenever we write down a process uh, and whenever we get used to it, usually it changes. Uh, everything is changing all the time. We are experimenting a lot, we are pivoting a lot, and you know the whole uh, the business is changing and evolving and we are well we are one of the main drivers of this change and uh, and i think that that's that's a good thing that's how we can uh, improve you know if we would just slightly improve um, like you know make make minor changes as with a corporate we could definitely get nowhere from from the ground uh, so we definitely look for people who are very uh, flexible and very open to this chaos and this change. And well, we said, hey, here's your computer, and here are a few problems to solve, and goodbye. Uh, <laughs> well, of that, course, it's uh, more complicated than that, but uh, similar but, but to that. Of, I think that, that that statement in itself for very for people who are grown up and are exclusively focused in the corporate environment is probably the scariest sentence you can say, right? Because it, it leaves an open uh, plan for what to do. And, and that's something you have to get used to. And uh, it's something that a lot of people can't adapt to. Yeah, they usually ask us, hey, what's the policy regarding this issue? <laughs> and I say, there's none. <laughs> and there's none for that either. And there's not at all either. <laughs> that's usually the policy. <laughs> well, it, which makes you, gives you a lot of room uh, to experiment with and to also to, to do some uh, real work. So, I would also add that. Yeah, sorry. sorry, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I would also add that uh, infrastructure may be a diff another word to add to this conversation. That at, at the corporate, you usually have the infrastructure to do uh, what you have to do. You are, there is a process, as you mentioned. You don't have processes. Uh, uh, maybe at a, a corporate, you have you 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 have defined uh, process with processes which are even difficult to step out and and have a different way of doing so uh, that's that's one thing but also it it gives uh, so when when an entry level consultant joins a firm uh, we basically only look at the potential he has and and we we give the infrastructure and the and the tools and maybe the the methods as well how how they can they they can they will be able to solve a project so uh, I would say this, this infrastructure world is, is very important for us as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chaba, just one question back to you. Do you think there's a turning point that will come mm -hmm. where you will have clear procedure, where you have to have this kind of standard operation? And if yes, then when, when would it be? Well, yeah. Uh, actually, I was just uh, bragging uh, since we have already a few larger companies who, which already have some processes. So like it's shop renter, there's already more than 60, 70 people working in there. I, I would say that they already they, they need some processes, but uh, definitely we try to keep it low. Uh, we uh, you know try to uh, maintain the bureaucracy as at, 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 at the minimal, the, the, the lowest minimal level uh, possible. Uh, still, it's not always uh, possible with the with the uh, startups, the real startups we have with uh, like five to ten people. Well, they definitely have no policy process or any, any anything at all. So uh, yeah, as as you grow, you definitely need some structure. You definitely need some kind of uh, predictability. And in in that growth, uh, you start implementing um, some kind of uh, processes. 
Uh, and what I, I noticed, based on our own experience and on other people's experience as well, is that it's uh, it's um, not like a linear process, but it's like you know sometimes you you overdo stuff, you read some management books, and you you jump in and create I don't know dozens of processes at once, which no one keeps, uh, and then uh, you feel that hey, and in other times you feel that there's too much chaos, and oh, you, you should have done this and this process or policy like a year ago. Uh, so it's, it's, I would say it's never an optimal situation. Uh, uh, you adapt as you go. So, you so, so I, think, I think what's important from what Shabba said is that actually as a startup progresses, it moves towards more structure, right? So that's, that's actually a natural evolution of its growth. I think the distinction here that people need to understand is that it's the depth and the level of structure, right? So, um, you know, I actually fundamentally believe that planning is a really important part of, of a functioning, successful business. It's the extent of planning, which becomes a question, right? To what level do you plan every detail and how much do you leave open for potential? And actually, a lot of the startups that I work with, I, I work with startups, uh, over a dozen startups around the world. Um, that's a recurring theme, right? When I first start working with them, we start getting down to the details of the launch code. So what's your value proposition? What's your product offering? What's your business model? These are actually things that you have to kind of create some assumptions about and use that as a basis for moving forward. So that level of planning, I don't think is 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 um, is a nice to have. That's a needed have. I think the distinction is, is that at you as you evolve the business, you have to be flexible enough to evolve your plans as well to match the, the feedback that you're getting. And I think that there is a is a big distinction between, let's say, a corporate environment where you really have strict plans and you deviate from those in a very, very unusual circumstances. In a startup environment, your plans are 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 structured, but they give you movement and give you opportunities for adjustment. Mm -hmm. yeah. What uh, I notice is that the, the, in this phase, the plans are more like just wishes or goals, and not real plans. I mean, our favorite saying is, I mean, uh, that uh, the you you always have a plan, but the only certain thing is that it won't go that way, which you, how how you plan. But it will turn out something totally different, different. And if you are if you are uh, not flexible enough, then you will definitely hit the wall uh, sooner or later. But but I think sorry, it's okay. But it, I'm sorry, just real quick. It's, I think I think to that point, Joba, I think you do have to have something to measure your progress against, right? So maybe the plan isn't how you expand it, expected it, but at least you know what your basis for comparison was compared to that where you ended up. Yeah. yeah. And maybe uh, but I would add one thing that uh, it's even, even in the corporate world, it's different for different companies. For example, a manufacturing company really is planning uh, in very detail what is coming in, what is going out. But for example, in my firm, in, in, in my uh, business management consulting, we, we don't actually plan everything to the uh, smallest details because because we can't we can't be because we are uh, uh, also uh, reacting to the to the to the uh, market and what are the our clients problems and we can build on those uh, in in short term and we can build new uh, capabilities and new new uh, professional uh, stuff but we are not actually planning you know, like the uh, the actual outcome of our of our services well we well, are living in a very very complex world which is changing very rapidly and i would say that each of us are in a in an industry which uh, well changed a lot in the last five years or even in in in, in the last year so i i, I would say that uh, yeah predictability uh, is 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 a wish or a luxury which uh, well, everyone would like but none of us actually have, and of course we should minimize uh, the the uh, the chaos as much as possible. But still, if you if you wanna well, keep up with the change of the world, you you uh, have to get used to these very fast and very constant uh, uh, changes. I, I I do believe that from an employee, a bit of other perspective, from an employee uh, point of view. Uh, I have something in my mind. For example, if I want to be uh, an employee at a startup or a corporate, and now we can kind of like play a game. If I'm a candidate and I would like to apply to each of you to a corporate, to a startup, uh, what would be the skills that you are looking for? 
the most uh, the, like like the skills that you say that yes, for for being a good uh, entrepreneur you need this. For being a good at corporate world you need that. What would be it? Uh, Andres, Andres, for example, I'm very curious. Okay, uh, so in our processes we are we are really looking for potential. How how uh, a candidate solves uh, a problem. So we even even during interviews uh, we give these uh, small cases to to the candidates and we look how how they think and how they try to approach that that specific problem and in the later phase uh, we also have a look at uh, how how precise how precise they are and and uh, and well we call it how eager they are that how much they want to work because even uh, management consulting is not for someone who would like to uh, a nine to five job and finish at five o'clock, go home and, and do their own thing. You really have to own the own the project, own the topic you are working on, so so that you 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 put the extra hours it, in it if 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 it needed. And I think this part this part is is kind of uh, similar to startup requirements. What other corporations may may look, uh, they 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 more just look at your capabilities. If they if you can solve the actual process or part of the process that you you are hired to do so, and you are very much uh, asked to asked to for a specific uh, specific part of the process. So not not the whole picture, but the big picture. That's that's how what, what I think. What do you think, guys? Um, I can I can jump in. I think I think that you know if I look at this as a as a question of okay, so how, how do you how are you successful in that business environment? I think the symbol of uh, the simple the symbol uh, so I'm sorry the single most important um, quality of success in a startup is agility, the ability to react to situations and to find solutions as things come up. I think that's probably the most important. Um, I think a close second is persistence. So the ability to stick with it, to break through walls, to overcome disappointments, and to to constantly find um, you know new energy and and new willingness to try new things. Um, I think on the corporate environment, the the ability to focus and to plan, I think, is a very important part of the thing. And, and you know to identify what where where you focus your end time and energy, and and I think there the the ability to to collaborate with others um, is extremely important um, because you are in an environment where you're dependent on a lot of different people to take part in the on ultimate result of what you deliver. So so for that reason, I think the ability to collaborate is very important. Having said this, I think all of these skills are important in business in general. It's just a matter of, of degree of, of focus or degree of importance. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just one sec, uh, Zoltan. If if I would be a founder and ask for your help, what would you look for me? Uh, more like I should be a visionary type of person, or an execution focus one, or a mixture, or, or what is the like? What would be the thing that you look for most as a as well, look, for founder? There, there, look, there are there are archetypes of, of of founders, right? The guys they write books about are the visionaries, right? So there's Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and you know Bill Gates and the like. But you know those people are one in a probably one in a million, one in a hundred million. Um, so it's difficult to build a um, a model around that. Um, I think that ultimately success in entrepreneurship comes down to execution. You know, every single person has an idea, um, and you know I would argue that ultimately the idea is probably five percent of the success. The other ninety-five percent is actually executing. And so I think if I had to choose between a visionary and an execution pro focused person i would i would i would rather choose the person who will go through a brick wall um to to execute than somebody who wants to change the world because um the first one is like hitting the lottery yeah in every generation there's a steve jobs but for every steve jobs there should be you know a million other people who just get shit done <laughs> i think that's that's really the the most important quality i think of a, of, a, of an entrepreneur i don't know chubba what do you think um yeah, uh, I uh, I think that there's a very big difference working in startups, whether you are a founder or or one of the first employees, for example. I mean, as a founder, I think you you need to have a very well unique uh, mix of skills to actually succeed. 
Uh, yes, execution is the most important part, maybe, I, I, I guess. And you really have to work hard and be persistent and, and all, all that stuff. But I've seen dozens of uh, very hardworking, smart people fail after doing something stupid for years. I mean, you, you, you really have to, you, you really need the skill to, to often step back and, uh, and have the self evaluation, have the humility uh, to, to uh, admit to yourself at least that, hey, all right, I've been doing this shit for, I don't know, two months, three months, and still there's no traction. Is this really what I should be doing? And you need to have the courage often to, to change course, even to, to turn like uh, 180 uh, degrees back and go back to where you, you've started. And um, that's, a, that's a very difficult part. And, and, I, and I often see that there are some people, some founders with a, with the strategic sense, as uh, Zoltan said, uh, who, you know, the Steve Jobs, all right, uh, who have the vision, the strategy, the high level of concept. And there are often people who are hardworking and smart and very good at execution. But I think that if you really want to build a successful startup, you need a combination of both. Uh, yeah. Of course, if you have such a founder, if there's at least a few very strategic minded people on the team, uh, then as a new colleague, well, it, usually it can be enough to have the right mindset, to have the growth mindset, um, to have the flexibility, the agility, uh, and, and uh, well, to, to have, also have the speed uh, to attack each new problem every day with the, uh, with the same enthusiasm you had yesterday and accept that many of these uh, well, projects of yours will actually fail and there will be a lot of setbacks and there will be a lot of problems, but well, uh, figuring it out uh, each day, it's your, it's your, it's your main, main job and, um, and it's, a, it's a never ending process, I would say. No. And, and, I th and I think that I think just to what Shabba said, that's the agility I was talking about before, right? The ability to change motion, uh, change direction in the middle of motion because you realize that things aren't necessarily going in the direction. The ability to recognize that is, is an important quality. Yeah, I really love the metaphor when, you know, building a startup is like jumping out of a plane and uh, assembling the plane uh, while you are still falling down. And the parachute, uh, then, yeah. Yeah. The parachute yeah. The parachute. Oh, parachute. oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I like that one a lot as well. It's very true. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Um, I do have the question. Like, uh, if I'm I'm a young individual starting my career off, uh, what should I focus on? If if I, for example, I want to be uh, like a consultant or I want to run uh -huh. my startup, and uh, I would start with Andres with you. Like, what would the mo the most essential skill I would have to practice? If I want to be great at that job, mm -hmm. or, or, or I do have also the question, sorry, that if I'm about to change my career, I'm in my mid thirties, forties, for example, and I want to change from entrepreneur mm -hmm. to more corporate lifestyle or vice versa, what would be, what would be your suggestions? Well, as I said, uh, we we really look at, at the potential and, and uh, the eagerness that uh, someone would, would like to learn about industries, about projects and about different tools. Uh, what what uh, a management consulting, a large management consulting firm can give you is, is you get flooded with, with, uh, with, with knowledges uh, and, with, and with methodologies which you can use to solve uh, the problems that you are given at, at, at the client side. So if you, if you can learn by yourself and you, you, can, you, can, you, you like to uh, also uh, research on different topics and different problems, then you, you can you can be very successful at management. But and once you you get the skills, you can get promoted. Of course, uh, it's usually uh, I don't know in two or three years you can get promoted to the next level and the next level until. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, uh, and 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 once you also bring the the revenues that you are expected to bring, then you can you can see to to partnership and and get a, a part of, of the company as well. Uh, and once you would like to change this, uh, the, the huge company can give you options as well. So first option is you go and find yourself a job. Uh, it's you have a nice uh, Deloitte sign on your CV, and you can <laughs> people will acknowledge it as as a, as useful and and quite uh, good. Uh, 
reference. The second, the second is, is that you change business line within the company. So you can go to uh, even without within consulting to different topic, different industry if you are already uh, specified specified to one industry, or you can go to a different uh, part like audit or, or a different financial advisory instead of management consulting. So this different different options. And the other part is, is that even if you look out to the to the global uh, global Deloitte network, and you would like to go to see a different country, like my friend went to Australia for two years, but the other went to, to Germany for only three months for, for, a small, for a small trip, for Italy. So it gives you the opportunity within the firm to really uh, to look for opportunities and new challenges. The last part is, is when you, when you <laughs> filled with, with Deloitte or management consulting or with the firm itself, you can also ask your, your, your boss or your superiors to help you to find a job which will suit you in the future as well. So for, for even for McKinsey, for Deloitte, it's very important to have good relations with these previous consultants because they sometimes become your, your clients. So you, you, you would really want to help them to, to get well in the future. And, and these these are the options. So you you find yourself a job. You look at a different challenge within the firm, or you you ask for help, and you really find something that is out of the firm, but uh, with, the help, with the help of of your colleagues. These, these so, options, yeah. so well, I believe the question was, what sort of path would you recommend, or what would be the path for for startup versus mm -hmm. corporate? Is that right? Is yes. That, okay. Yes. So, if I'm like a starter, my career, yeah. Yeah, so if you're starting your career, look, I, I think I think that um, your the path you choose is going to depend heavily on your relationship to risk and uncertainty. If you're somebody who is comfortable with risk and uncertainty uh, as just a part of life, then I think you're going to be more comfortable in an entrepreneurial environment. If you're very averse to risk and uncertainty, then you're going to be more comfortable in a corporate environment, and I think that that in itself is is maybe a bit of a personality characteristic, or it's you know what you've seen in your family and your model, right? So there's a reason why a lot of entrepreneurs come from entrepreneurial families because they were built up in this sort of you know environment of of, of risk and uncertainty. As to which path you follow, um, I actually think everyone would benefit from doing two three years in a corporate environment. Maybe that's heresy for somebody like Shaba who's never worked in a corporate environment. But I genuinely believe that the skills that you learn are valuable even as an entrepreneur. You know, the ability to analyze problems, to be structured in problem solving, to do what you're going to say you're going to do, which is a constant expectation of corporate environment, um, in collaboration with others, um, sharing opinions. You know, there's a lot of stuff. And I, I immediately, when I'm interviewing somebody for a job, I immediately know after about 10 minutes whether they've ever worked in a structured environment just from the way that they answer questions. It's, it's very clear to me. So I would say if somebody's starting out, I would definitely recommend you do your two years at Unilever or Deloitte or wherever just to, just to get that foundational experience um, in your career. Um, having said that, as you progress in your career, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the corporate environment that you just have to get used to. And there's, yeah, there is politics and there is relationships and there's a lot of things that you have to just deal with and manage. And that's part of the process. And you can grow in that career ladder and hopefully become successful as well. Um, but there could be a time when you just decide that you don't want that, you know, either you're, either you're professionally no longer challenged by that environment, or let's say that you've got a bit of financial independence and you want to try something a little bit more risky, then it's a good idea to, to try to get into an, an entrepreneurial environment. Um, as to later in your career, let's say, I mean, when you're sort of 25 to 35, frankly, you could do either one either way. I mean, I don't think there's, you know, you can go back and forth. I, I did the same thing. I left my corporate job when I was 28, went back when I was 32, left when I was 40, went back when I was 43. So, I mean, I've, I've done that path. And I think that um, if I'm looking at a later stage, like if I'm 40 plus, I think your ability to go from a corporate environment to an entrepreneurial environment is much easier than vice versa. If you've been, if you're 40 and you haven't had a corporate career, your ability to get into a corporate career is very, very limited because there's going to be a bunch of people who've been there since they were 25 who kind of built their career and it's just a lot more difficult to, uh, to, to enter it. And so I would say that if you're in a corporate environment and you've got an entrepreneurial itch, then you know there's never uh, it's never too late to make the jump, but you have to understand that the experience you're going to be 
getting into is going to be radically different than what you've grown up in. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this up. I just wanted to actually ask this question that would it have, what do you think, would it have to be spend like two, three years in a corporate environment, then jumping into entrepreneurship? Because Chaba, you mentioned that you've never, you've never worked in a corporate environment. Uh, what do you think? Uh, would it help you or not if you would have spent one or two years? Uh, believe it or not, I, I totally agree with Zoltan, uh, what he's saying. I, uh, I often wish during the last, I don't know, 15 years that I, I wish I worked for a, a big com a company and learned the basics of, uh, of uh, how a, a large enterprise works. Uh, from my own experience, and I, 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 I wouldn't have the need to actually learn it uh, from uh, my own example or from books or from, you know, just uh, advice from other people. And uh, yeah, I, I often feel that, uh, that, you know, those people coming from uh, who spent a few years with, with corporate, they, uh, they, they, they know the basics, uh, usually. I mean, yeah, they usually do what they say, uh, except politics. They uh, often do project management. They, they often can manage their own time. Time management is not, not, not that obvious for, for, for a lot of you know, interns and uh, people who just start in the careers. Um, they can do communication. They are usually they prepare well for a meeting. They, they can ask mm. solid questions. All those uh, stuff, which often well, the lack of these basic skills can often drive you crazy when you are working with with a total novice uh, you know coming from the university um, on the other hand uh, the best the most loyal colleagues of ours including uh, our ceos running some of our biggest companies were totally uh, you know in-house uh, talents uh, who, who joined uh, inonic group when from straight from college say from university and uh, I often feel that uh, spending a few years uh, in a corporate environment not only gives you a lot of skills, very useful skills, but it can also, well, kind of corrupt uh, you culturally if you are not careful. And it, I, I, I thought I know that it's, 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 it's a, I can say for all kind of corporate environments, but it often happens. And uh, then most of these people often get cynical, for example, and they often do not believe uh, if you are, if you claim that your main goal is not, I don't know, uh, conquering the world and building some great company, but they always believe that you have some hidden motivation, for example. Uh, and, and, and yes, this must be a generalization and it's not true for everyone, but still, uh, culturally speaking, I think that being a corporate virgin <laughs> yeah, often helps. Uh, but for the skill development, yeah, I would say there's no better school than um, by joining one of the uh, well, great enterprises who's been working successfully with thousands of people for the past, I don't know, 50 years. I mean, uh, they definitely do know how to manage stuff and train people. Yeah. Uh, Andres, what do you see during consulting? Is there a difference like that, like someone coming from the entrepreneur world? Uh, starting a business or being in a corporate environment than, than starting or being just an entrepreneur at, at a full life? Yes, I also, well, I, I agree uh, with, with both of you and also would add that uh, it depends on the person. I mean, if some, some people just can't take these, uh, these processes, rigid processes, or, or they, they, they don't like aligning to the actual company. So it's, it, I think everyone can find a company who they can really fit into as a team or as a, as a professional but uh, really these visionary people who who just want to they they're really convinced of of their idea and they want to pursue that then uh, they 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 must they must do this uh, but as as i see it as well one once an entry person comes in we need one uh, one and a half years to really uh, get to and then show and introduce it to, to our process of our way of working and and thinking and then uh, they can really fit into and and develop themselves mm -hmm. and have 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 you andrash has it yes. ever happened that a successful uh, someone successful in entrepreneurship 
actually changed into corporate life and became successful there as well. I mean, I've never seen such an example before so far. My uh, me neither. So, so the guys who had startups or had startup uh, uh, experiences, they they came in, they they saw our corporate world and left within a, within one year because they yeah. couldn't handle this this yeah. rigid. It, it, it often happens that they are yes. fed up with the startup world and they had some failures and they ooh, they need some rest and they go yeah. into a corporate yeah. environment. Yeah, I, I, I'm 100% sure it's easier to go from corporate environment to entrepreneurial than vice versa. I, I, I agree with mm -hmm. you. It's, it's much, it's a much different uh, environment. And, and even interestingly, you know, I mean, you, you often associate the corporate path with, you know, people who are good at school. They got good grades. They always follow the rules. They, you know, there's certain characteristics. But if you look at a guy like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, they both went to Harvard University and dropped out after their first year. Um, clearly, they were top of their class, very smart guys, but in their character. They simply would rather launch a business from scratch when they were 19 rather than finish Harvard, right? So there was a, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a personality I think that that drives that type of of change. Yeah. Mm. Actually, I do agree with you. Uh, I never really worked in a corporate uh, environment before, and uh, now you put me in a, in a hard hard uh, case because. Because I do believe that once I would say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm I'm okay with the entrepreneurship and I want to change, I do feel it would be hard for me as well to be in this rigid environment as well. Otherwise, yeah. it would have been much, much easier. But do yeah. you, do you um, see any differences? Because we are talking about, I mean, we're all in Hungary based and uh, we're working with Hungarian companies. You use all the time work with international companies as well. Do you see any differences between corp corporate and startup in Hungary versus global other countries? Western countries, Eastern countries. Like, well, I'd say, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'd say, look, I, a corporate um, is probably less so. I'd say I'd make a distinction between big corporate organizations based in Hungary, let's say, if it's a, if it's a, a Hungarian company that has grown into a large corporation, it's probably different than if you are the local office of a global corporation. Because if you're a if you're a, a corporation, let's say Hungary, let's say your mole, for instance, the the gas and oil company. You know the decisions are made here. You know you're building the business here, so you have that benefit. If you're the daughter company of an international uh, conglomerate, it, unless it's a very unique situation, you're not making a lot of big decisions locally. Those are done centrally, or there's some sort of thing. So there's a distinction there. On the entrepreneur side or the startup side, I think the biggest distinction I've noticed between startups in call it Central and Eastern Europe, broadly speaking, and let's say in the United States, certainly, but even parts of Western Europe, is that the the startups in, in this part of the world are very much technology driven in the sense that their founders are product focused people who have some innovation that they've developed. And there's this sort of assumption, I think an incorrect assumption that, you know, if I build it, then my customers will come. Um, unfortunately, that's not how uh, startup works, right? You've got to create a product that's got solving a problem You've got to be able to position that in a way that people understand what problem you're solving and why they should pay you money for that, right? So that sort of very technology product focused approach um, is in contrast to, let's say, Silicon Valley, where basically um, every next to every technology guy is a marketing guy, you know, and the two of them are collaborating together to build not just a business that's interesting technology, but a business that is a meaningful um, profit generating, you know, organization. And that approach from day one, I think, is the biggest distinction I've seen between startups in this part of the world versus, let's say, more advanced Western markets. But it makes sense if you think about it. I mean, uh, there are thousands of great product people, engineers, product managers, all those stuff, because all the big multinational companies are having their product teams, their development teams here. Even yeah. the Hungarian big startups, Prezi, Ustream, uh, Logmin, they, they kept their product teams here, yeah. but how many sales or marketing team has been operating from Hungary? Well, none, zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there's actually no talent, no, no, no sales or marketing related knowledge here. You have to go out. I have to travel to the United States whenever I want to listen to these ideas, but not anymore since COVID democratized this stuff. And now I can listen to, to every conference for free, but before COVID, uh, I, I, we needed you to travel, and uh, I think that's why uh, there's so much more technical talent here and experience here than marketing or sales-based uh, knowledge. 
and everyone, including myself, we are learning from books how to do marketing and how to do sales and what does this world looks like. And of course, well, we can talk to other people, but it's definitely much harder than someone living in the States or even in the Silicon Valley and just walking into a Starbucks and uh, I don't know, meeting a lot of talented and experienced uh, uh, you know, hustlers and marketing guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so actually, if, if you're a corporate person and you wanna make a transition to the startup world, if you're a strong sales and marketing person, uh, and you're prepared to do it at the level of the detail that you have to do at a startup, then I think you've got an open door um, because that's the biggest uh, missing uh, resource, I think, for for most startups and early stage companies. Yeah, if you are a, a tech founder, finding a great co-founder who is strong at sales and marketing, well, that's, uh, you know, uh, Dula Fahir, uh, he also had some nice well a talented uh, us based partners co-founders mm-hmm. who he started his business with and well Dula was doing the the technical part yeah. uh, of you stream and uh well, the guys were running the show in, in the states and this worked wonderfully yeah and the thing um, with Peter, by the way you know the the, the marketing and we came from uh, peter adre who's swedish hungarian yeah so he's from not from uh, the hungarian market Um, uh, in, the, in the meantime, there is a Q&A uh, going on uh, for those of you who are watching the live stream. Uh, down there, you can see this uh, sleeve that dough and you can ask your questions. Since we haven't received any questions yet, uh, I do have a question um, for, for you guys um, and to each of you. If that would be one thing to change or there would be any change in your career path, what would it be? Um, like corporate startups or, or like a different, different, uh, any, any path, what would you do? What would you take? Uh, and with Andras, maybe if you would start, if you would have chosen a different one. Uh, one well, uh, now you make me interested in, in startups. After. <laughs> <laughs> no, Andras, you, are, you are welcome. I'm also no, no, I'm, a, I'm an open-minded guy. I, I, I also like uh, new, new challenges, uh, but uh, <clears throat> for I, I wouldn't change much until now. So I'm very happy uh, with with where I'm where, where I am at the moment, and uh, I've been lucky as well uh, during my career at Deloitte. Uh, what I would think is is, uh, is is agility that I would change a bit in in the corporate world, which we have already talked about, and and uh, Zoltan also mentioned that that uh, that people who like agility and who like to take more risks, they are willing to do more uh, uh, startup and, and and this sort of entrepreneurship, and I I feel that uh, I I have some. I'm also looking for a bit more risk and a bit more uh, challenges at the moment. Uh, not at the moment, but I might look in the future. Uh, so, so this this is an option for me. But until now, I'm very happy that uh, I I really feel that what we also talked about that we the, that we, I have the base and the the basic structuring and and knowledge uh, that will help me if whatever I do in the future. Thank you. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I probably have the benefit, of, I think probably the, being the oldest guy in the room here, the virtual room. Um, I, I think that if I look back at my career, which is, you know, basically 20, 30, almost 30 years now I've been in business. Um, I think that um, the path that I chose is something that I'm comfortable with. I, I, it's difficult to say, um, should I do something differently for me? Personally, I had a bit of an unusual situation that I grew. I was born and raised in the United States and went to university there. And then uh, it wasn't until after university that I moved to Budapest. Um, obviously, I have a Hungarian background uh, culturally and and and, and uh, through my parents, but I I was born and raised in the states. And so, in that sense, I could have stayed in the United States and built my career there. Um, I chose not to, and I ended up building an international career in Budapest, in London, and in Germany. And so, I think that could have been a different path for me to take, but I'm, I'm very comfortable with the one that I've chosen. Um, I think that right now, as I look at the work I'm doing now, really supporting early stage companies and trying to, to, to strengthen their go-to-market strategy and their organizational productivity, 
um, that um, that a lot of the experiences I gained from that corporate environment are very relevant. Um, and perhaps what makes me a little bit uh, unique in that is that a lot of people with my background um, don't have the, uh, the the patience and the the, the focus to, to start working with such early state companies. I actually enjoy it very much because I can see the the immediate impact that I can have on their development. And I think that in itself is a is a very valuable um, uh, part of what I do today. And I'm and I'm hoping to I'll be doing it for a while. Well, Zoltan, I wanted to ask you uh, how much money have you spent so far on your pronunciation, Coach? Uh, because I spent a lot and my pronunciation still sucks. But no, I understand your trick. I'm a kindergarten teacher, so I, <laughs> I, have, to, I, have, to born, I have to be born in a better place. That, that, that's the solution, all right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what would I change? I mean, if I if I were to restart my career uh, with, with the current knowledge I have, uh, of course, I, I would make uh, so much better decision. Uh, since I, in retrospective, I know how you know all the stupid stuff I've, I've done during this uh, 15 years uh, career of mine. Uh, but I mean, if I were you know go, go back uh, and start over with the stupid mindsets. Uh, well, then I would uh, take uh, Zoltan's advice, I guess, and maybe yeah, have a few years of uh, experience with Deloitte or uh, some other great companies, and um, and then maybe start my own company. Mm -hmm. I think it would have accelerated the early learning process. Uh, the first five to six years, I would say, it was more about struggling uh, for survival <laughs> and not really actually, you know, conquering the world and building something great. Uh, it came later after we figured out the basics. Hey, how to make some money, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is important. Yeah. And and what would be what would be the ideal corporate environment and corporate field to start to start with before becoming an entrepreneur, for example? Is there a specific that you would you would mention? So, so I think I would say that if, you know, I think you know, we, we lump everything into corporate, but actually there's different elements of corporate, right? So, um, you know, there are corporations, large companies that actually are managed in a very independent way. And so that individual markets have their own decision making authority and they can, you know, the local leadership is, is, uh, is operating independently. Um, and, and I would say that um, I personally had this experience. So when I was CEO for TV2, we were part of a very large German broadcasting group of Prozim and Sadeins, but I as CEO was responsible for the PNL and I had to make the decisions about running the company. Uh, then years later, I went to work for NBC Universal in London where I was sucked into the matrix, right? Which is basically, um, you know, all of these dotted lines for people working in different parts of the world and, and, and everybody has four bosses and nobody knows actually who makes a decision. Um, everybody has got an opinion, but nobody's got the decision making authority. So so I think those two sort of uh, worlds are both corporate, but they're very different. And so what I would very much encourage people who are looking at that as a career is to find a company where you're actually working for um, a, a situation where you can impact your decisions and you can implement your decisions because that's what you're actually going to learn a lot from, right? Um, I think that people who get in, sucked into that matrix early in their careers, um, they're sort of like um, caged. Uh, this is going to sound horrible. I don't know, but they're like kind of caged animals, right? So they're, they, they they think they're free. You know, they're like and they're like the, the the tigers in the zoo where they've got these fake mountains and and water, but they're actually behind a, a cage, right? So. They think they're free, but actually they're not doing very much because they're part of this matrix. So I would encourage very much people to look for those type of, of situations. And obviously you can't necessarily make that decision from day one, but you'd look for those opportunities. Um, and if you are within a corporate environment, I would also very much encourage people to find a mentor as early as possible, somebody that you can learn from and somebody who will help guide you uh, because that's also a huge. I've benefited tremendously from from having very good mentors who 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 helped me as I grew through my career in a corporate environment. Um, so those are the two things I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking about corporate startups, but I might believe there's a kind of middle way as well. Like we haven't touched upon SMEs, and I'm mm -hmm. talking about like small, medium-sized enterprises, companies with a let's say employees between ten and fifty. So. Uh, would it be ideal to start with an SME or, or what are that in that matter, the key differences, if you touch upon that? 
I, like, I would say it, dep- it depends on the company itself. I mean, I've, I I know quite a lot of well, very bad small and medium business leaders who I wouldn't work for any money. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I also I also know some uh, very 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 good ones, decent ones. So I think it, it, it's it's really uh, it's really uh, based on you know the company and, and your choice. You know, even with, with startups, uh, well, most startups I would say they try to be. You try to create an environment where you can actually excel and there are better companies who do it better and there are worse companies if uh, if there's one company which i see from the outside who's really good at it even though they they've grown a lot is uh, is netflix um netflix they seem to uh well, seem to be able from the outside i haven't worked that as, as you know uh, but from the outside they seem to have find the right balance between uh growing uh, exponentially and also maintaining this uh, startup ag- agility and culture and and uh, the freedom uh, to 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 be an entrepreneur within the big uh, company. And uh, well, I I like I love learning from all these great startups, not only from Netflix but from Amazon and and uh, and, and the rest. But uh, if I were to read any of the listeners a book, I would definitely read the book of uh, Reid Hoffman uh who, who who wrote about uh the netflix culture and it's a great read i think mm-hmm. what i would add to these uh is is just to make sure that you 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 enjoy the work that you're doing and that you feel somewhat special or it might be a very small reason because I, you think that this is the best company in the region, in the country, or in this specific product or service that you are doing. But if you if you really believe uh, in the in the mission and and uh, the product that you are selling, then then you will have the you will have the energy and the courage to to succeed at the end, uh, wherever you are. So I think that's that's just common common life life lesson that but but you really have to like what you do yeah agree completely right we do have still uh just one or two minutes from this panel discussion um and so far there's no 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 question uh from the audience and we touched up a lot of things uh I don't know if there's anything that you would like to add to this, uh, this topic, guys, anything that we maybe missed or anything that you think would be very useful or um, very handy to, to touch upon, to say, to add to this. I would like just to share my uh, favorite quote on the wall. I mean, we have quite a lot of quotes, motivational stuff, and educational stuff uh, in, in our office. And my favorite one is that, um, I'm constantly surprised how stupid I was two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> and the average business leader. Uh, and I think it, it, it's very true. I mean, the, I, I, I'm always surprised, yeah, how stupid I was two weeks or two months or two years ago. And um, I always think that I'm so fucking clever in this uh, right moment. <laughs> but I, it always turns out that yeah, it was not the case uh, in retrospective. So I guess that um, having this, uh, having the humility to know that whatever you think right now is uh, well, is definitely not the best way, and always be very open-minded to listen to other people and to learn uh, and, and to force yourself to learn, even in those fields which you think that you are good at. I think that that skill would be very very useful, whether you are in a startup or in a corporate environment. Um, and the world is changing very rapidly uh, from what I can see. So even there, there are, I'm sure there are quite a lot of skills that are very useful right now. In 10 years, it will change. And uh, I think that you, 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 need, you, you, you need to be prepared and you have to go for the long run. And, and you know, there's this book uh, called uh, The Infinite Game from Simon Sinek. I highly recommend reading that one as well. Uh, he has some very good points about not just concentrating on the, the very short term and but actually yeah planning ahead from for uh, 30 years and seeing um, uh, what to do based on that yeah a very idealistic person i love, love him too as well a uh, great final quote uh time is up guys 
Uh, I think we touched upon a lot of great uh, thoughts. And thank you so much, Zoltan, Chaba, and Andras for being here and, and, and sharing your ideas and thoughts about this topic. And now we will have a pitching session. So I will give back to the words to Atahan. Thank you so much again. Okay, so I'll, I'll be signing off now then to discuss. Uh, well, I'd like to thank all of you for a great discussion. Uh, it was really great and insightful. Uh, we now have the pitch night and uh, Pamela from uh, ePod Society will present their startup. They will have three minutes for their presentation. And after that, I really would like our uh, speakers to give them feedback about their startups, about our presentation and other things that they might want to add. They might want to add. So uh, Pamela, the scene is yours. Yes, hi. First of all, do you hear uh, me? There's a little bit of a connection problem, but I think it's okay now. Yeah, there's a. Uh, okay, this is the best connection I can have for now, so I hope. Uh, um, okay. A little bit better right now, I guess. So we can start. Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Pamela Osman, and I'm the co-founder of uh, ePoets uh, Society. Actually, our started one year ago. My co-founder uh, Ralph who is a writer, uh, failed to self-publish his Arabic books uh, uh, on uh, international platforms. And that is due to the complexity and the complication of the converting Arabic uh, files into e-books. And as you know, the Arabic language is uh, read and written from right uh, to left. And the shape of the letter uh, changed depending on the placement of the letter in the word, which makes this uh, conversion process um, uh, complicated and not so many softwares can properly read uh, this conversion. So since then, we understood that uh, uh, why there is only 1% of Arabic uh, ebooks on all the international uh, e-libraries. And uh, despite the fact that there is one billion uh, Arabic reader uh, in the world, uh, which is basically a huge uh, potential art. And we were convinced that converting Arabic files into ebooks is uh, hard and um, time consuming and that, uh, a process that needs continuous updates. So this results in more uh, problems, such as, for example, very little uh, Arabic uh, content. Um, there is lack of original titles. There is no incentive for uh, readers to pay for subscriptions. And uh, most importantly, no opportunity for self-publishing. So now, knowing that the, the worldwide uh, ebook sales is uh, $30 billion and our market size is $60 million plus, uh, uh, ready to be addressed and conquered once we uh, own the solution, this is how ePoet Society made the difference. So first, we developed and implemented an automated system that allows Arab writers to properly convert their files into EPUBs. Uh, second, we are continuously uh, enriching our original content uh, with our scouting uh, talents team. Uh, we provide readers an easy paid access. And last but not least, of course, we provided uh, our Arab authors an easy uh, self-publishing, uh, simple self-publishing uh, platform. So in 2020, we got basically, we got funded twice from Phil Rouge Capital for a total of 200,000 uh, euros in order to acquire 3,000 uh, authors, 
7,000 ebooks and 25,000 users. So what we have achieved so far in terms of product development, we have launched our um, uh, new revamped website, our Android uh, application with a built-in uh, reader. In terms of content uh, development, we have added uh, more than 700 authors, uh, 3,500 uh, ebooks, and a website traffic growing to 50,000 uh, visitors per month. In terms of our digital marketing campaign, we are ready now to uh, execute it and of course ready to measure the conversion rate optimization. Uh, we are ready to uh, measure our hypothesis, uh, hypothesis and multivariate testing. So as a result to our solution, we expect to exponentially grow uh, to be the biggest Arabic e-library uh, in the region and uh, with the highest number, of course, uh, of original uh, titles in uh, three years' time. Uh, therefore, our projected 950,000 subscribers and 750,000 direct uh, sales show a potential of a $100 million uh, business. And uh, therefore, uh, our, of course, our management team is fully dedicated and completely passionate to achieve uh, to achieve each designed uh, milestone. And um, in order to accelerate our growth and after achieving our second fund goals by mid of 2021, we are seeking, uh, we are seeking uh, 500,000 euros in order to acquire um, um, uh, 50, um, uh, just, uh, yes, 105,000 users uh, 10,000 writers and 21,000 ebooks. So basically, basically, uh, it is time uh, to let the Arab world relax, uh, slow down, and read for less. Thank you, and I hope you heard something. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, well, your connection was fine, so we were able to hear everything you said, and that was a great presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, now it, it's our it's time for our panelists to give feedback, supplement questions if they have any. So, what do you think? Uh, do you have anything to say about Pamela and her presentation? All right, uh, I guess so. Can you hear me? All right. So, uh, my question is that uh, so it's a library, right? So, do you sell? Uh, sell books or or do you rent books so what the, what's the business model maybe you you've told us just uh, i haven't understood this one so how, how do you actually make money with this library yes for, for yes for the moment we are selling uh, arabic ebooks direct sales in the near future in the upcoming months we are planning to switch to subscription model mm -hmm. All right, uh, and uh, so uh, just and for our Arabic get... content. All right, and how do you? I mean, how do you get the customers? So what's the, you know? Do, do you have the acquisition channel? I'm just wondering. I mean, it's very hard to compete in the book industry uh, with with Amazon and the like. Uh, I mean, I'm in e-commerce, kind of myself. So uh, yes. Uh, so basically, this is the reason why. Yeah, uh, um, the, the conversion process of Arabic uh, books and Arabic files needs a continuous uh, updates on Amazon. Because of the nature of the language and the nature of the, you know, we move from right to left. So the character, uh, the letters change their form in the sentence or in the, depending on, you know, the placement of that letter in the word. So uh, authors, first of all, are not familiar at all on how to properly convert this uh, file into proper, pro proper e-publication. Uh, completely uh, the opposite with the English content or any other content which is from left to right, you know. So basically the file, the Arabic file, if you upload it um, and the system converts this file, it will be catastrophic. You won't be able to read it properly. So, um, um, 
In terms of self-publishing, uh, we are the only self-publishing platform in the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, for the Arabic authors. And uh, our publishers, the publishers are finding uh, our solution more convenient and more um, simple and easier to, you know, to have their content uh, online. Mm -hmm. All right. Andres? Yeah, thank you. Uh, great, great pitch, and, and thank you very much. I, I also just had a look at the company's website, and it looks uh, quite professional as well. Uh, how many how many employees do you have, and and uh, what is what is the current state of your 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 services and your company? Yeah, So in terms of the team, we have basically most employees. We outsource some activities uh, such as digital marketing and some social um, and um, graphic designers. Mm -hmm. uh, so in in house, we have ten employees. Uh, we have around 100 publishers that we partnered with. Uh, we are at this phase of finishing our product development. I mean, it will always uh, require, uh, it will always demand, uh, you know, development and uh, improvement. But uh, let's say the, the basic and the main features are now available. And soon uh, we will have more additional uh, features to be, um, you know, uh, activated. Mm -hmm. um, so now the, the reader can enjoy reading Arabic uh, books. And we have mm -hmm. our, um, this is also one of our competitive advantage uh, content that we aim at increasing. Um, and we hope uh, with time we will have, uh, you know, 50, 50, 50 of original content and uh, the, the rest is the common content uh, also on other platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. So our original content is basically um, uh, one of the things that we, uh, we fight uh, for and it's one of our uh, advantages over our competitors. Mm -hmm. So original content is not available anywhere else except on our platform. And mm -hmm. these, uh, these you know, potential bestsellers can be turned into series or uh, movies or, you know. Yeah, thank you. And what was the next stage? Are you looking for investors now or, or what is the next, next step for you? Yes, actually, uh, we are planning to fundraise, uh, let's say, mid of uh, April, May, something like that. Yes, and we, we started, now we are starting our to implement our digital advertising campaign. So <clears throat> we, we have to measure, our, evaluate the, the result, especially the conversion rate. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, based on those results, we will be more accurate in our funding uh, requests. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you for your questions. I think, uh, is there any, any other things that you would like to mention or ask to Pamela? Uh, well, I checked your website and it's, it's, it looks decent enough, right? And, uh, it's true. So it's very nice and uh, it seems to be working fine uh, from <laughs> the user perspective. But of course, I haven't placed an order yet. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> My Arabic skills are rather poor. Yes, <laughs> we have also, uh, we have also uh, the trailers. So for our original content, we do a trailer for uh, the potential, you know, for the uh, potential novels that have, uh, you know, that might really sell. Uh, so we do this trailer or um, one minute video, uh, you know, a brief or synopsis of the novel. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So you're, yeah, becoming, you're turning into a publishing company. As I, yes, as I understand, right? 
so from from uh, digitalization to rather publishing once yes. once you have the okay all right yeah that's an interesting business and uh, yes, there's a lot yes. of different opportunities to grow well right. uh, well thank you for your feedbacks and it was really great to hear about pamela's startup and what uh, they're trying to achieve uh, in my opinion i think it's a really good uh, thing as well uh, thank you and i would like to thank you for the great pitch and wish you all the best in continuing your business Uh, good luck, well, thank Pamela. You. Thank good you luck. all so yes. much. Well, here we are at the end of tonight's stream. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank all of you so much for taking time to spend tonight with us. And a uh, big thanks to our panelists, Andras, Chaba, Zoltan, uh, and Zolt, and also Pamela for her pitch. And thank you so much, you guys, for taking time uh, and also for your weaves on corporate team and startup team and your uh, sharing your experiences with us. Uh, we also thank all of you who watched today's stream and gave us your time as well as our partners, Eurasian Startup Awards, Miat Group and Startup Grant Budapest for their contributions. At the same time, I would like to invite you all to our events in UK, which is going to happen two days from now, and you can already register on our site. And we are looking forward to seeing you there. And for the whole Distop family, I wish you a pleasant rest of evening. And good night.